Uh, thanks for sticking around at the end of the afternoon there. Hope you're all well caffeinated here. We'll try to keep this uh, fun and interesting. I, I, I do think this is kind of a, uh, a fun topic to talk about. This is, I'm going to talk about how you know, we can make your research famous to a, uh, a public audience of, uh, uh, you know, including uh, talking to the news media and, and getting your research out to the, the general public. Uh, I'm really glad to have Misty Long here because I know many of you are, are in the, uh, the medical center here and she's the one who all knows the most about that, that sort of thing and she will uh, uh, pipe in quite a bit during the presentation and uh, help me uh, explain to you what we do. So first, uh, just a little bit about our office. Uh, we're a very small but mighty office of, of three people in uh, research communications. We're part of the university uh, communications office. Uh, so you've got two-thirds of our whole staff right here today. Um, I, I cover mostly uh, social sciences, business, humanities, the, as I like to say, the non sciencey sciences. And uh, the third member of our staff, Pam Gorder, covers the physical sciences and, and engineering. So basically we want to let the news media and the general public know about you know, what kind of uh, uh, great work our faculty are doing here. Uh, it, you know, as Stuart mentioned, I uh, used to, to work at, uh, uh, in the traditional media and uh, back in 1985 my newspaper was kind of the one of the, on the vanguard of the uh, declining media here. Uh, the Columbus Citizen Journal uh, went out of business about 1985, which is when I, when I came here. So one of the things that we are dealing with, how do we uh, promote Ohio State research when the media is in decline, especially the science and, and medical research. You know, I, uh, for those of you who are older, you may remember most newspapers at one time, it seems, had uh, a science section. Back in 1989-95, uh, uh, science, weekly science sections. And then by 2013, there was only 19 left. And I, I'm sure there are uh, even fewer left there now. So what we want to do is try to find ways to tell our own stories to, uh, to the general public. Um, and, and, you know, we're not abandoning the, the media by any stretch of the imagination, but we're really working to find new ways to connect directly with the public here. And uh, one of the ways that we're going to, we do this is through our website, uh, news.osu.edu. This is where you will find all of our stories. Uh, uh, you know, even, even this has changed, and, and you'll see more changes in this website in the next few months as we're going through a, a redesign here. But at one time, w our website was kind of focused on getting media attention. It was like a public relations website to help the media. Now we're looking much more at uh, reaching directly to the, to the public. Like uh, this, just a very recent story that you may have seen that Misty did, um, that you know, is getting a lot of attention on our website. But as I said, we're still also trying to get uh, attention um, through the news media. You saw there's uh, uh, quite a few media stories uh, about this, including the dispatch. And the dispatch mm -hmm. to a it's story? It's on the front page of the front, dispatch. Front page of the dispatch, uh, a, a, a money-ish, which is a Wall Street Journal. Um, website and Inc. Magazine, as well as some others. So this is how we're kind of trying to combine uh, traditional public relations with, with, you know, trying to get people interested in uh, coming to our own website. And again, you know, we cover all kinds of science here. Here's something that, that Pam did uh, out of uh, uh, geological sci earth sciences here at Ohio State. So what kind of stories do we promote, Misty? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yes. We promote primarily peer-reviewed published papers that we deem to be of interest to the general public. Stories that we think will grab the media's attention or 
sometimes we know we're probably not going to capture the attention of traditional newspapers or TV or radio, but there are some more trade-oriented online publications that will be interested in the science that comes out. Um, we do everything from basic science to clinical research, but always with an eye on can we explain this in an effective way to the public, and are they likely to pay any attention if we do? Is that a good summary? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and, and mostly what we do is, is peer-reviewed research, but we also cover stuff uh, some, from some of the major conferences. Uh, one of the conferences that MISTI goes to uh, occasionally, the Society for Neuroscience, as a matter of fact, is one that gets quite a bit of media attention. So there's a few meetings like that uh, that we will um, cover as well. Uh, you know, another thing that we're often asked about is, you know, hey, I, I got this new grant. Can you help publicize that? We don't normally do that. Uh, that's um, just because it they, they doesn't get a lot of attention uh, in the media. Uh, it seems like, in general, the public doesn't care as much about grant money. Uh, I, I guess the exception is when they're very, very, very large or there's uh, something interesting about it. I know, and Misty, you've done a few releases about more on the, the every once in a while there's grants that come out that are just about interesting kind of, of research uh, that, that, you know, again, it, it has to be something about, um, something people care about. Mm -hmm. So like a really novel approach to potentially treating Alzheimer's, for right. example, something that it's a huge topic in the media and with the public and also this grant is big and the design of the study is something that really has you thinking, wow, is this even possible? Could, mm -hmm. this, could this pan out? So. Right. So, you know, because we can't do everything, you know, one of the things we definitely want to l let you guys know is that most of you have college or unit communicators uh, in your area. And sometimes some of the things that we can't publicize, uh, you know, are, are things that your units can. And, and, you know, they can put them up on their uh, college or unit websites and uh, find ways to publicize it that way. Um, so we definitely work with the, the colleges to make sure that we, we cover things uh, appropriately and uh, you know, rest assured that even if we can't do something, sometimes there's, there's other ways to, to get the word out about your uh, grant or other, or maybe a study that we don't feel can get national attention, but maybe uh, uh, your college or unit communicators can help you get some more localized attention or, or something in a, a, a trade journal. So. So as we said, you know, it's, it's mostly we're looking for things that are, are newsworthy. And uh, it's, it's something that, you know, we, uh, um, it's, a, it's a little bit subjective, but, you know, uh, Pam and, and Misty and I have a lot of experience choosing which ones. And, and Misty, you know, she's, she's not so far removed from the media, too, so she knows very well what, what the media and the general public are going to be interested in. You know, when it comes right down to it, we do about 100 stories a year, major stories. Uh, we do some smaller ones as well. 100 stories about new research at the university. Um, obviously, you guys, there's, <laughs> you're very uh, productive. There's thousands of studies that come out of the university every year. We, we can't cover them all, and we have to make some choices there. And if you want to know how to, to you know, what, what is it, the kind of stories that we do. I think the best things to do is uh, follow us on Twitter at OSU Research, our Facebook page. We, we always feature our new stories. Uh, and not only do we feature both on Facebook and Twitter, we feature the stories that we've written, but also some of the media coverage that our, our research gets too. So if you're interested in, in what kind of stuff uh, makes it out to the public, those are some great places to look. And then, of course, our, our website, news.osu.edu. So now that you know a little bit about our office, let's talk a little bit about 
you know, if either we do a release uh, on your research or somehow uh, uh, a journalist finds out about your work. Um, you know, it's very important for you to, to feel comfortable and, and know how to talk to journalists. So Misty and I are going to offer you some tips about how to talk to journalists and, and other lay people. And it's really a balancing act. Uh, you know, a, a lot of science is, is difficult. It's not uh, easy for the general public to understand. Um, so we, we have to find ways to, to make uh, it accessible to people. But, you know, without, we also want to make sure that, uh, you know, it stays true to your, your research as well. Um, I, I guess one of the things that we, we like to say is, is you know, uh, many of you teach classes as well, too. This, this is a little bit different. Communicating the way we, we're talking about here is a little different than, than educating. We don't want everything to be a lecture. Uh, I think, you know, more conversational styles is, is really what we're, we're looking for. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to uh, uh, kind of fall into the trap that, to think that everybody uh, knows what we know, and that's certainly not true. We need to, to do, you know, give our messages in a way that, that people can understand. We also, you know, don't want to talk like scientists. This is a, <laughs> uh, one of my uh, favorite books to recommend, Don't Be Such a Scientist. Randy Olson is a scientist, by the way. And he talks a lot about how to communicate in a way that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and we know that can be really, really difficult, mm -hmm. not because you're refusing to try to help other people understand your science, but because you're immersed in a group of people who understand it generally, right? Day in and day out, the terminology that you use when you're talking to each other about your science makes sense. It's your language. And even I, I noticed in myself when I was covering medicine, I started that in 2000 and wrapped it up in 2015. And while I think I improved a lot in terms of story selection and depth of storytelling and all of that over the years, I also started to slip when it came to word choice sometimes. And um, it, because I was talking to scientists and to physicians so often, I understood some of their language now. And I was reading their journal articles. And instead of having to look everything up, it was coming naturally. But it was also coming out in my news stories where it shouldn't be. So I know it can be a challenge. And we're definitely here to, to help that. It's, um, it, you know, I always say a, a contusion really is a bruise, <laughs> no matter how many times you say and hear contusion. Right, right. So, yeah, definitely you want to you want to think about your audience uh, here. Did, do you have a question there? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not going to kid you. That's 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 difficult. It's not. There's not. I, I think a, one simple answer there. You know, a lot of the the things that uh, Misty and I use in our stories, we we have our certain words. You know, some people would call them weasel words in a way to to, to um, you know tell people that you know this is not settled yet. That we still, you know. Uh, this recent study suggests, rather than this study has found, you know, this, this study, uh, uh, you know, in a small sample we have found th th this, you know, we, you, the language that you use in these cases is, is very important. Um, 
you know, and again, it is a balance because if, if you use too many of these weasel words, it's like why, you know, the, the, you can get the reaction is why are you even telling me this? It's right. not, you're not, you don't have, you're not giving us any message at all. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act, it really is. Yeah, I'm working on a story right now that'll go out on Monday that is basic science and it's really important molecular process that this lab has discovered here at Ohio State, but it is nowhere near changing clinical practice or, or creating a new therapy for HIV or cancer, but someday it could. It's, it's something that has not been well understood historically, and now that this target has been identified, it opens the door to thinking about therapeutics that might intervene in this process. And so what I did in the story is I acknowledged that potential down the road possibility pretty high up because what, what is the public going to care about this? I can't even remember the term to use for you guys for what this thing does in the body. Um, but I assure you it's correct in the story. Um, it, so I think the, the thing is that we do want to entice people into reading what we write, but we, in our office at least, are very, very careful about not overstating where the science is. We, we put in all of those caveats and we're, we, we read each other's copy and with an eye toward that, not just copy editing or style or that sort of thing, but did you, did you address the fact that this study was in animals pretty high up. Did you, usually in the headline or the sub-headline, right. we get that right out there. And there are outlets that don't hold themselves to those standards. Right. And, and you know, it, it, the, the way we do that, it works. Uh, I mean, you're, the last speaker, uh, one of the last things he was talking about was the, the work that they were doing with that mesh that could uh, separate the oil um, motor oil or, or oil spills from water. We wrote about that several years ago and you can still find that on our web. And we actually had the videos like he was talking about separating the red water from the blue water and stuff. And you know, we put in all the caveats in that there too and, and now you're, you're seeing you know, it, it in fruition now that you know, the companies are actually starting to develop this, this research. So that's you know, again just how we uh, operate in the sense of uh, making sure that we show the, the potential stuff uh, without overpromising. You know, w one of the things here that I talk about is, is needing more than a message. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes the, the stories, you know, that, that we tell are about a new research project are just that. It's just here's the latest paper, latest study or whatever. But people really do love stories. And what I would encourage all of you uh, is, is to, when it's appropriate, to tell the stories about your research. You know, uh, reporters uh, and people in general love to hear not just that you found X, but how did you do that? What made you interested in that in the first place? What was the process for you to get to that point? You know, oftentimes, people will remember what you found better, I think, if they know what you had to get through to, to find that. Uh, it's not always appropriate. You know, sometimes the reporter is looking for, you know, a, a 300, 400 word story about your latest paper. But even, even then, I, I think if, if they hear your story about how this came about, they may, you know, revisit you later and, and say, hey, you know, I'd like to do a longer story about your work based on, on what your story is. Along those same lines, before you move on, yeah. um, sometimes it can be beneficial to explain the background of the area in which you work, too. Mm -hmm. like, even though this paper is about this little part of this big body of work surrounding lupus, for instance, uh, it may help get the public interested and or even our office or the Med Center PR team interested 
if they better appreciate why you're trying to solve this problem. Like, what's, what's the background? What, what's this big problem for lupus patients that this might serve to help down the road? And um, I, I know that when I, when I read a study, the sort of that first section where you're citing everybody else's work, it can be really, really helpful to me because I, I don't, I'm not immersed in what you're immersed in. And, oh, gee, you know, you know all of these things already. It helps me understand why you're trying to answer the question you're trying to answer today based on what's been done before. And thinking about how to give somebody that background in lay language can be useful before an interview or a pitch to our office, too. Right. Right. So I mean, here's just some, some general uh, piece of advice to help you as, as when you're you know, preparing your message to give to reporters or, or other uh, people here. And, and again, the, the, the main one is to, to keep it as simple as possible that people can understand. And, and how do you do that? You know, several of the uh, things you can do is, you know, metaphors, analogies, examples, always helpful there. Um, you know, and, and building from the familiar. If you can say, you know, that this this finding that we have here is similar to something you already know, uh, that's that's another uh, way to really help people understand it and keep it simple. Um, obviously, uh, not using jargon. Say it's a bruise and not a contusion, right? So, um, uh, you know, and, and, and making it relevant. Uh, as, you know, Misty was giving an example of, of what she's doing uh, Monday, you know, it, it's okay to say uh, that this research doesn't find this, you know, but this research, you know, if other scientists or we could build on this research and we hope that someday it could have this clinical sig significance. This is how it could be relevant uh, to your life. And, and just I think in general, um, knowing your audience is obviously very important. And I mean, even talking about uh, to, to the media, you know, if, if you were interviewed by the, uh, the Columbus Dispatch uh, or some local newspaper, you might have to explain it a little bit different than if you're talking to Scientific American. Uh, you know, the Scientific American may ask you some questions that uh, you, can, you can be a little more uh, scientific with, frankly. So here's just some general tips uh, uh, working with the news media. You know, first of all, don't avoid the opportunity. It, you know, one of the reasons we're here is to, to encourage you, and, and I, there are some people that probably don't want to do this, but we think you know, it, it's, it's good to let people know about some of the, the great work that we're doing here at Ohio State. And uh, even if you're a little bit nervous, I, I think you know, it, it's worth getting over that and uh, offering what, what you have. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, you don't have to feel pressured by a reporter uh, to, to talk, uh, do a specific interview. Uh, you, you don't have to be pressured to talk about a particular topic or, or say a particular uh, point of view. There's, you know, I, there's reporters like anybody else, there's some who, who might have a certain uh, point of view going into the story. I, I, I don't think most do, but they may try to get you to say uh, something that fits into their narrative and, and you don't have to do that. And their narrative may, rather than bias or yeah. something like that, may just be based on the last story about breast cancer that they did. Mm -hmm. I, I see this especially with um, TV news where reporters don't have the luxury of a consistent beat. They may be covering mm -hmm. a murder today and right. a medical research story tomorrow and I've been alongside some of these interviews where the person really thinks they understand this thing about one example I remember is a breast cancer story and the poor scientist was trying to go along and trying to answer this these this line of questions that really had nothing at all to do with anything he was studying and it was one of his first times working with the media. But we, I let them talk for a while, and then 
stepped in at some point and said, I, th I think maybe it'd be helpful to just go over the key points of what your study find, has found and um, explain why that's significant and different from this other conversation we've been having that's also important, but not really pertinent today. And right. there, there are gentle ways to nudge people in the right direction uh, when they're innocently going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, this next tip is kind of an old school one. Uh, most times these days, of course, reporters will contact you by email, uh, but it, it's, it's somewhat relevant there as well. Uh, you know, if, if, but if you do happen to get a call from a reporter and, and they ask you about something, and, and even if you're interested uh, in talking to them, it's, it's perfectly okay to tell them, uh, you know, hey, let me call you back uh, after I get a chance to think about this or gather my thoughts on this. Um, you don't have to, to talk to them right away. Um, this, this is one of my favorite things, frankly, right here, and, and best pieces of advice, I think, uh, for this. You know, whether, whether you're talking about your own research, whether you're asked to comment about somebody else's research, whatever, it's helpful to, to prepare. I come up, I say the number three, but uh, you know, you can have two or four. It's, cool. it's okay, I won't care. Uh, points that you would like to make about this. Uh, you know, in most uh, media stories here, you, you know, you're lucky if, if you can make that many points anyway. So come up with those two to four points. You know, have them written down in front of you, uh, the points you want to make. I think, you know, during the point, during the, an interview, I mean, you can refer back to them constantly to make sure that those are, are hammered home uh, because the reporter hears you, you know, saying something more than once. They'll start, you know, they'll get to, you know, understand that that's important. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, don't answer their questions. I'm just saying that's really something to make sure you uh, get what you want to say out to the, the reporter. You know, and just again, keep it simple. You know, one of the things that reporters will often ask uh, faculty members, uh, experts to do is, is comment about maybe somebody else's study or if, if you're lucky enough to study something that's, that's in the news, uh, something uh, to comment on some news event or whatever. Uh, and, and that's perfectly okay to do that. It, it is, but don't also feel pressured uh, to talk about something that you don't know a lot about. Um, you know, just remember that, you know, a lot of these reporters know nothing about your field at all. And the fact that you haven't done research directly yourself, that doesn't mean you can't talk about it. You know the literature, you know, especially for a local reporter who, who wants to talk to somebody from Ohio State on, on this particular issue, you know, they don't care that you haven't done the research yourself. They're actually more interested in talking to somebody locally, somebody who's from Ohio State who, who knows about this. So, you know, you're an expert on that field, and, and it's perfectly okay for you to, to talk about that. It's also okay for you to, if you look at the study they're asking you to comment on, mm -hmm. and you very quickly realize that it's limitations, and there are serious limitations, to, to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was writing for the dispatch, I was so grateful when a source outside of the study that I was writing about would, would point out a, an important limitation that maybe I hadn't recognized because I hadn't written about this topic before, or would talk about what questions it, it opened up for them that they hadn't thought about before. So sometimes the person outside of the research outside of this particular study brings this interesting perspective. Like now that, now that I see what these people found at Duke, I really would love to find out this other thing that's right. related and that can be really helpful to reporters. Right. Right. You know, so, you know, one of the things you always see in, in the movies, TV shows is, you know, of course it's not usually about scientists, but People yell, no comment, no comment, no comment. And, and that's not something you should ever have to, have to say to a reporter. Uh, you know, 
you know, a reporter may ask you a leading question or, or something that's totally irrelevant to your research. Uh, again, as, as we said earlier about, it's, it may not be out of malice, it may just be that they just uh, don't know enough about the field to, to ask the right questions. But rather than say, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on that, you just kinda bump that question to a side and answer something else. You've got that list of three comment, you know, three uh, main points you wanna make. You say, well, you know, that's not something I know anything about. I, I'm not, uh, I don't really know that field or that's not something that I, I'm familiar with, but I can tell you that, you know, and pick one of your three points that's kind of closest to, to what uh, the reporter's asking about uh, and, and go with it that way. Um, believe me, the, the reporter will be fine with that, uh, uh, that they, they're just looking for a good story and, and you know, that's what you can, you can give them. Yeah, it makes you even more trustworthy when you admit what you don't know. Right. Instead of trying to come up with an answer on the yep. fly. And again, you know, anytime a, a member of the media contacts you, um, you know, you, I'm not saying you have to contact us uh, for every uh, single time you get contacted. Actually, you're, depending on your college or unit, so they, they may have different rules here. But uh, as far as the university level goes, we, we don't need to know. But at the same time, we're more than happy to help. If you have a question, if it's a reporter from an uh, uh, outlet you're, that you're not familiar with, you know, uh, you know please uh, let us know. You know, these days, uh, so many places have such weird names, you know. BuzzFeed, Gizmodo, uh, io9. But some things that sound like they're ridiculous and you should not waste your time <laughs> are actually legitimate. I'm right. even learning some of the new ones since right. I've been here. Right. Like quartz is something I didn't even yeah. know about. Exactly. But it's pretty good, usually. Yeah. yeah. So feel free. You know, that's what we're here for. We're, we're glad to, to help you out if, if uh, you're not familiar with the person, with the, uh, with the outlet, or you just have uh, questions about you know what they're what they're asking you about there. So, so here's a, a again a very important point that that Misty and I have certainly learned through the years here. Um, when you're talking to the media, you know rem remember you're talking to the the general public here. And, and, and frankly, you know, and this happens when we're writing uh, news releases about researchers' studies, you know, oftentimes they, they want to change some of our language back, add some jargon back in or whatever, uh, you know, be, and, and they, a lot of them have come up and said just like, boy, if my, you know, my colleagues see me saying this, they will say that's not right, that's not, that's not correct, you know. And it's not that it's not correct, it's just, a, you know, it's the simplified version. It's not the way you would talk to your colleagues about this research. But, you know, again, we're, we're trying to, to communicate to a larger audience. We're trying to uh, spread the message to a, a group of people who aren't familiar with your field. And, you know, it's very important for you to realize uh, you know what what you, what your goal is here, and that's to 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 meet to talk to a, a general audience. Um, so, any questions about those those uh, specific? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it doesn't I, matter. I think as a reporter, yeah. I wanted to talk to, if possible, the person most familiar with the details of the work, and that's sometimes not the corresponding author, yeah, <laughs> as right, you right. guys know. Um, and we don't, in our office, um, shy away at all from talking to postdocs or even mm -hmm doctoral students who've led research as the primary source in the story, sometimes they will say, can you include a quote from my PI, or I'd like to do the interview with my PI, and that's even better because um, they may 
they may, one may remember to highlight something that the other forgets. So I, I, when somebody's on deadline and wants a source real quick, they probably just want whoever is best able to answer the most questions, I think. Anything else on this part? And we'll obviously give you a chance to talk, uh, ask questions at the end as well. But we wanted to uh, uh, shift gears one more time here and talk about one other way to, for you to reach the general public uh, with actually uh, minimal uh, interference <laughs> or help from, from us here. And this is a way to kind of tell your own story to the general public. Uh, it's a website called The Conversation. Is, has anybody heard about The Conversation here? A couple people have. Um, it's a relatively new website, uh, just around a few years now, uh, that is basically where scientists talk directly to the public, write directly to the public, uh, write explainers about the research, or they use their research to explain uh, various societal issues. Now, uh, faculty members, any faculty member, or graduate student for that matter, can write for the conversation, but the, the conversation has university members who are, are paying members. Uh, it gives them a little bit uh, you know, better access to the, to, the, uh, to the conversation. And Ohio State is one of the paying members because we really do think this is a, it's that important, it's that great of a way to get the message out about Ohio State research. Um, so, you know, their, their, their tagline is academic rigor, journalistic flair. So they, what they really want to do is, is, is have, uh, you know, good stories about your research and, and your expertise. And with the help of the editors there, um, put that in a, in a way that everybody can understand. And, and one of the key things about the conversation that makes them so successful is that uh, they have a Creative Commons license where anybody can republish their work. And because they're so good, they have got such great editors there so, uh, that, that work with you and the faculty, their stuff is republished quite a bit. Uh, Washington Post, uh, uh, various other places, I think I have a slide come here. You know, these are, are just some of the places that have uh, republished stuff uh, directly from the conversation. So, you know, basically what this is, is that that means that, you know, your 700, 800 word essay about your research is, is being published in full in one of these major media outlets. And that's really cool from our perspective. Uh, you know, we can, we can send a news release out uh, about one of your studies and, and you know, maybe a, a brief mention of it or or there may be, it may be combined with other research from other universities and stuff. But to have, you know, 700 or 800 words all from you uh, in a major publication like that, that's, that's really cool and it's hard to do. Uh, it's, it's very hard for us to get, as, as PR professionals, to get something placed. It's much easier to get something placed that's directly from, from uh, you guys. Um, so, so far we've had 124 uh, of you have written articles, have written 200 articles as of a couple days ago. They've had 6 million views total there, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, you, you're, um, uh, one of the cool things that a lot of the faculty members like about this is you get a, a dashboard that will tell you exactly how many people in real time have been reading your articles uh, and, and where it's been republished at. And it's, uh, you know, I, I know that a lot of faculty members have told me how gratifying it is to, to you know, you, know you, you put out a journal article and you wait months or years to see who's, uh, you know, uh, referenced it in their papers or whatever. This is real time uh, um, validation that people care about what, what you're doing here. Um, so six million views are one, our top article has 706,000 views, just that one article. Is that tell still Al's yeah. story? Yeah, yeah. Well, tell them about that. You know more about that yeah, one. So Al Demby in the College of Public Health um, studies labor issues, and he had a paper that I wrote about that was about 
how women who consistently work overtime um, years on end have jobs that require them to work overtime have this disproportionate amount of heart disease and cancer and I think maybe diabetes was in there too. So basically there were, there were some correlations with health outcomes and he ended up pitching a story to the conversation and what arose was this really cool story about the four day work week and how people think that they will love having a four day work week but in reality, it may end up being like working overtime for those four days. It, it could be really taxing and not as, not as great as you would think. And so this story just took off like crazy when it first went out. But then every time that there's a three-day weekend, it spikes again yeah. <laughs> because yeah. people are like, oh, why isn't every week like this? I love having three days off. And his story just keeps going. And it ended up in ton of different places yeah. republished. So. I, I think the, the, the main one that got the most was CNN. CNN website has, yeah. has published it. And I think like even like CNN, like every time uh, there's a three-day weekend, they, they put it back on the front page of their website there and it gets another 50,000 views yeah. or whatever. And Al's naturally a pretty good writer, but he was someone who was a little bit nervous about the prospect of doing this and how much time it would take away from his teaching and research um, commitments. And he just has, he has so many great things to say about it. And I, I don't think it's just because he's the number one story. Mm -hmm. I, think he, I think it just was a really good experience for him working with the editor there and figuring out how to narrow his focus and come up with kind of a hook from his research that that would draw people into it. So, right. so here's here's just give a, a couple of quick examples. Here's a, a uh, study from uh, Claire Camp Dush in the uh, Human Sciences, and this was this is a, a an article based on her her research. And then th the other thing that sometimes happens is that the uh, again you know you can comment you can do articles, not so much on your research, but again, based on your expertise. Um, and this next one was a, a professor of, of political science. Uh, the uh, conversation was actually looking for uh, someone to write about, you know, where's, the, where's uh, uh, the U.S. military these days? How does it compare to, to other countries? Are we, are we uh, falling behind? And so we have this article, has the mil American military falling behind? You know, based again, not so much on his uh, one study or whatever, but based on his uh, expertise in that area. I'm going to play you a, a short video. Uh, I think it's very really interesting that uh, with some faculty members who are talking about how uh, they. Um, they um, you know, why they, they write on or have written for the conversation and a little bit about that process there. And it's, uh, let's see, sorry, yep. And it includes one of, uh, uh, an Ohio State professor in here there, so. I think the conversation is the best invention to come along in academia for the last 15 or 20 years. I think writing for the conversation is the easiest way to get your work out to a broader audience. I really value the conversation for that space it creates for rational, fact-based, evidence-based conversation that still is accessible enough that even if you don't have a background in nuclear social science, you still can access what we're saying and really engage with it. Normally, when we work on our research product and submit it to a journal, a very limited of people will be exposed to it. The reviewers, the editor, and if you're lucky enough, those who will cite you. But it's still very limited exposure. When you write to the conversation, your research gets out there to everybody else, I mean, the rest of the world. The partnerships that the conversation has with a whole host of other media outlets, including some very popular ones, increases the span of who will see what you have written. I think the first one that I wrote got picked up by Time. And that sort of magnified the audience. 
Some of my work that I've written for The Conversation has been republished in places like uh, The Guardian and Lifehacker, and it's exciting to see your work in all these different places. After writing an article for The Conversation about terrorism, I was contacted by a group and wound up giving a presentation to policymakers and practitioners in D.C., which was totally unexpected. And what's neat about the conversation is they have an author dashboard in which you can see who's tweeted about your work, where it's been republished. Also, you can see you know, just how many people have read your article or clicked on it. And that makes me feel like my work really is having an impact on the world. Uh, yep, I'm going to send that to you this afternoon. And if you don't see them by tomorrow morning, give me a call. So it starts by just submitting a proposal or a pitch of, an, of a story that you would like to write about and why it's important. I was given a deadline by which to prepare a draft. We need to go back a bit further in that. The editors are good about providing you with ways to phrase things or to structure your sentences in a way that's going to make them easy to understand. How is your analytic argument related to your normative argument? We don't really learn how to write for the general public, either in graduate school or as part of our professional training. But what I personally experience in working with editors is you learn a lot. You learn how to frame the problem, what question to ask, how to organize your material. I mean, you might think you're a good writer, and then you're like, wow, I just learned a lot from that. And the World Health Organization in the UN put out a big report on water and sanitation today. And there are authors who have journal studies coming out and will do something for us when the journal study emerges. The editors who work at the conversation, they're journalists, and they can help me refine what I'm writing in a way that you don't have to be an academic to understand what I'm talking about. They set up an online portal for you to work in where you're working in real time editing and you're able to get immediate feedback from them electronically. I think that would be a good way to get more people reading your story. Go to the conversation right now, read it and write for it. If we don't do it as scientists, someone else will fill the void and the public will get information that may be not accurate or is written by people who don't understand the work that you do. My advice to faculty who haven't written for the conversation would be give it a try. You're going to enjoy it. It's fun. This is not about publicity. This is not simply about getting a wider audience. This is about really the future of truth. That's our, uh, <coughs> our little pitch for the day. Um, so just to give you a little uh, idea of how successful we've been there, uh, as you can see here, it's just getting more and more um, attention to our uh, articles for in the conversation here. And you know, it, it took two and a half years to get to a million views. Uh, and now, let's see, about four years later, we're up to six million views. So it's really uh, a great place to get uh, uh, attention to your work here. Uh, just in general, uh, we've, you know, I, I talked a little bit about earlier about telling our own stories. And we've, uh, tell our stories through our Ohio State News, uh, the conversation. We have a couple other places where we post our uh, stories at. Uh, in fiscal year 2017, we've had 6.1 million page views altogether through other different sources. Uh, that was nearly double from the year before. Uh, so we, we think we're doing a better job of, of telling stories about the great work that our faculty here do. Um, and, that, and again, that's that six million doesn't include all the the uh, attention we get in the in the mainstream media. Uh, but and nearly half of those page views are from the conversation, which is one reason why we're very high on on the conversation there. So, um, thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, we appreciate uh, you coming by and sticking out here till the end here. Um, any more questions there? I, I do, do have a short uh, a, um, sheet in the back there that will, on the conversation, if you want to get a little more information on that. Any more questions? Yeah.
Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and of media. Right, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I wondered, you know, the conversation has surfaced. I see that as maybe a way for us as scientists to communicate directly with the public in a way that maybe builds trust. Right. Um, but I wonder if you have other thoughts on that conflict other than just... I, I mean, I do think that that is, it's, it's, it is a good way to do this. You know, frankly, uh, despite our, our best work or whatever, there's, there's some... Um, I don't know, uh, there's, there's some thoughts out there that, you know, the work that we do in our office and the media in general is like there's, you know, are, are we telling the whole story? Are we, are, are we being uh, uh, truthful? Uh, I think most, many of the polls still show that, that scientists in general, uh, people have more uh, faith and belief in them than in the media uh, and in a lot of other institutions. So I mean, I think that may be part of the reason that the conversation has been so successful is that, you know, they're hearing directly from you, the, the people who do the research. And so I think that's, um, you know, that's key to, to getting people interested. And that one thing, you know, you, you talked about, uh, uh, you know, you, that you do some very sensitive research. I think one of the things that is true for both the conversation and for working with uh, our office here. Um, you know, both sides, you and the conversation, you and us, before anything goes out, we both, ha all of us have to be happy about what goes out. Uh, if you do a news release with us, we uh, send it back to you before we send it out to make sure everything is accurate. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, it does faithfully re, uh, reflect your work. But, you know, at the same time, if, if you make a lot of changes and put a lot of jargon in there, we can decide at the end that, you know what, we don't want to put this out as well. And the same thing goes with the conversation. So it's really a collaborative process and, you know, nothing uh, will go out in, in either case without you guys being happy about what, what's going out. I could see the temptation, given what you're talking about, to say, Never mind, you know, the, there's this minority that's very vocal who refuse to believe science that's been very well established, but it is a minority still, and I, I firmly believe that. And then there are bad news outlets that some of which aren't really even news outlets. They're just mouthpieces for interest groups. And that's frustrating for us. It's frustrating for legitimate reporters. It's frustrating for scientists. But I think the best way to counter all of that is with good, responsibly reported information and writing for the conversation, granting interviews to reporters who you know you can trust based on their previous work and based on the publications or outlets for which they work. And, um, you know, you got to fight fire with fire, I guess. Right. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for your attention and for sticking around to the end. We appreciate Thanks. it. Okay.